Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. It's the summer of 1588 and all is not well in England. Citizens are plotting to betray their monarch for Spanish gold, and the dreaded armada is coming closer and closer. It's up to the Queen's sea dogs and navy to stop them. But will they succeed in convincing Queen Elizabeth that such action is necessary? And when the Spanish ships finally arrive, what will happen to the Virgin Queen and the citizens of London? How will this affect the exploration, settlement, and colonization of North America? And now, the dramatic conclusion of the Spanish Armada. On the 28th of May, 1588, a fleet of 151 Spanish ships set out from Lisbon, bound for England. Its mission was to transport a huge invasion force across the Channel and assist in the overthrow of Elizabeth I. Two months later, this mighty Spanish Armada was sighted off the coast of Cornwall. Elizabeth was to inspire the English sailors with a famous speech in which she declared, I know I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king, and a king of England too. Palling weather, poor planning, and spirited English resistance defeated the Spaniards. After a brief battle, their battered fleet fled. This tale of religious dispute, shifting political alliance, and naval brilliance has entered into our national folklore, although some historians argue that it changed nothing. When did first contact take place? First contact took place on the 30th of July and then the subsequent two days. That was when Drake's fleet encountered the Armada for the first time. I'm keen to come back to defend Drake against the idea that he was nothing but a pirate. Privateer. Well, yeah, but uh, I think we were calling him a pirate when he took the Rosario, and I completely understand that. But what we also have to understand is that on the English ships, the captain was in sole command of everybody on board that ship, which wasn't straightforwardly the case on the Armada ships. Drake had this kind of rule of leadership, which he picked up from classical lit, amazingly, that the captain should take a hand with the ropes in a crisis and haul on a sheet if necessary. And we've actually got a letter from one commander in, on an English Navy ship saying, I can't write this letter, I have to get a scribe to do it because I hurt my hand hauling on a rope. This is a nobleman. My bet is that Medina Sidonia wasn't hauling on too many sheets. No, but nor was Howard of Effingham. No, I mean, that's certainly true. It's got to make a difference, yeah. whereas mm. the equivalents of Drake's, people like Bertendona or Don Hugo de Moncada, who mm. dies with an arquebus shot through the shot. head, are doing exactly that. A good military commander or naval commander will get down and get his hands dirty mm. when there is a crisis, but not the commander-in-chief. You know, mm. you have to compare like with like. That's Can certainly I fair. I, I never did hear of Howard of Effingham hauling on any no. sheets. <laughs> Can I turn to Nicholas Roger now? The, in the early days of August, crew event took place, the Battle of Graveline. Can you tell us how that battle unfolded and what significance it had? Well, we've jumped, as it were, over a number of days of very slow progress as the Armada works its way up the channel, with the English constantly skirmishing and firing at them, avoiding coming to close quarters and firing their famous heavy guns. What the English hoped and what the Spaniards feared was that this very heavy armament, no Spanish ship had anything like that kind of armament, was going to knock the Spanish ships to pieces. But actually it didn't happen. There was a good deal of damage, but nothing fatal. And the Spanish fleet arrives in due course at the Narrows and Anchors off Calais, which is a French port, but with a governor friendly to the Spanish interests. They're only 30 miles or so away from where Palmer's army is known to be. The crisis of the campaign has arrived. Everybody's aware of this. The Spaniards are asking the question, where is the Duke of Palmer and his troops? Why are they not lining the beach at this moment? The English are asking precisely the same question. Where is the Duke of Palmer and his troops? He can't be far away. And for the English, the critical thing is that the Spanish fleet cannot be allowed to lie in Calais roads a moment longer while Palmer's troops presumably are marching rapidly towards were they? it. Uh, no, not that rapidly, actually. But <laughs> both sides thought they were, and there was every reason to think that they were. So the English have to get the Spaniards out of Calais roads as fast as possible, and since the English themselves are anchored only a mile or two away to windward, there is an obvious way of doing it, namely fire ships. And this is what they do. Can Such you just tell listeners who are not familiar with fire ships how these things operated? Simply, you get an expendable small ship. In fact, the English basically grabbed any small ships they could find, stuffed them full of everything that will burn. Ships are full of things that will burn anyway, so it's not terribly difficult. 
you get some bold volunteers who will volunteer to sail the ships towards the enemy fleet and when they get fairly close light the blue touch paper and pile into a boat and pull like hell to get away <laughs> and since wooden ships were very very inflammable and of course full of powder as well as everything else this is a very dangerous weapon it's liable to terrify people and cause panic it didn't i think cause panic in the spanish fleet they were prepared for it. It was the obvious means of attack. They had orders what to do. They actually managed to get hold of these fire ships and tow them away. But what they did have to do was to cut their cables, which means, of course, losing precious anchors, and clear away to sea. And they never got back to their anchorage. And the English were able the following morning to mount a major attack in which, I think because they were desperate, they came to much closer range than they had risked before. Close enough for people actually to shout to one another from one ship to another. So we're probably talking about a fighting range down to 50 yards or less. And at that range, the English heavy guns began to cause really serious damage. Is this the turning point? Do the Spanish fleet then turn north and abandon Mission A and start Mission B, which is to get back? And the way they sought to get back was to go right round the British Isles, past the north of Scotland, down past Ireland, and blah, blah. Is this the point where that happened? It is for the reasons explained that they lose their anchorage. Now they try to get back to it, but they can't. The winds are against them. And they hold on as much as they can simply because they believe the army is ready. And it was almost ready. I mean, people are very critical of this strategy, but it almost worked. I mean, they were hours from making it work. Mm. Uh, so it is risky, certainly, but it isn't that outrageous. So what they do is they try to hang on there as long as they can and then the wind changes and starts pushing the armada towards the sandbanks of the low countries. And for a time, the Spanish fleet believes it's going to be destroyed, not by the English, but just they're going to run aground and some weather. of them yeah. do by the weather yeah. Yeah. and then miraculously as far as they're concerned the wind changes and gives them this prospect of actually going northwards and on the 12th of August uh, Medina Sidonia gives the order to go northwards but he tells everybody go slow if the wind changes we'll turn back and in fact the English are not at all sure that the armada will not come back to the channel However, the weather doesn't change and they decide that what they're going to do is go round about Britain, as you mentioned, in order to get back to Spain. And it's after Graveline that Queen Elizabeth gives her famous Tilbury speech. In the wrong place. I mean, why they assemble what troops they could muster at Tilbury when the Spanish plan was always probably to go to Kent in the kind of correct historical manner is a bit of a mystery. And anyway, the troops that they'd assembled at Tilbury were an extremely ramshackle group. There was one group of men who had bows and arrows but hadn't been trained to use them, for example. But yes, that's why she does the speech. And I'm sure it was very motivational. But it does illustrate that they didn't see the threat as over. They didn't feel that the events on the Flanders banks had settled things, that they felt that there was still a danger. And they felt, therefore, that the speech was still worth making, that they still had to rally the infantry troops that yes. they managed to muster up. So we're still in flux. The, the Spanish fleet, which is still powerful and feared, hasn't by no means been defeated at this stage. It has been battered, and the English are snapping around and coming close and getting rather desperate and hammering away, but it's still a big mass of ships, well manned in terms of seamanship, but headed north, trying to go with the weather. Yes, the English at this point, and the English had a whole series of major fears, but nobody thought they'd won a great battle, or indeed that the issue was actually decided. The English had virtually run out of ammunition, they had been firing at a faster rate than anybody had ever done before, or they themselves had expected to do, and they were virtually bluffing at this point, because many of the ships had no powder and shot left at all. And the natural expectation was that Philip II had prepared a port somewhere in the North Sea. There were a number of available potential allies. Hamburg was a possibility. Scotland was a possibility. There seemed to be some obvious for the Armada to have a base prepared where it could take refuge repair damage and return when the wind served to renew the campaign and that was what the English were really frightened of. They went round Scotland, they were battered by awful weather and round Isle they ran out of food, they ran out of water when they got on the shore, they were butchered. But quite a considerable number got back to Spain, about three quarters. But what was the significance to Spain of this episode? In the short term, of course, they were devastated, but three quarters of the fleet, as you say, returned. The loss of men, of experienced soldiers and sailors, was actually much more serious than the loss of uh, ships. They can be replaced far more easily. 
But Philip II simply got on with it. He immediately started repairing them and thought in terms of sending another fleet the following year. In fact, that fleet isn't ready at the time when the English do a counter armada and try to invade Spain the following year. And that expedition was a complete failure. And by the end of 1589, both Philip II and Elizabeth have, in fact, if not entirely disengaged, decided to refocus and get involved in the French Civil War. So they don't really fight each other for a number of years. What effect did this have on England when it was clear that when the dust, well, when the sea settled? <laughs> I think it's fair to say that if Philip had hoped to improve the situation of English Catholics, then nothing could have been more disastrous. Because the English really didn't believe they'd won a great and final victory even in the 1590s. They were expecting Philip to re-engage with them. And they were terrified of a fifth column of Catholics within their midst. And the result was a really crushing persecution campaign with torture and inquisitorial tactics for people who had done nothing much worse than import a few forbidden books. Did it have a big effect on English morale and sense of itself? I think it did, though in the long term, rather than immediately, yes. but in the long term, it is the key event in a long process of creating an English national myth yes. which identifies the sea and war at sea as the way in which the English nation in arms is at sea and not on land. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride. 